Um, so thanks, Keith. Uh, I'm Neil McRae. I work at BT, a small uh, telecoms company here in the UK. Um, I'm going to talk about something completely non-BT related. So um, some of you may know, many of you might not. Um, I'm named after Neil Armstrong. Um, and it's kind of been a, a big personal thing for me over the years in terms of what, what, getting into engineering, going to certain universities, um, and kind of learning about how to build big things. That's what I like to do. Um, so I'm going to talk about, and, and I don't claim to be an expert here, and I certainly don't work for NASA, um, but um, I've been studying and reading a lot, and I've been, I go to NASA maybe three or four times a year um, to get some inspiration, and, to, and I think we often don't learn from history, and I think Paul's slides earlier on, you know, remind me about things I'd forgotten about, and, and I find this quite, um, quite helpful to think about. So, you wind back to the early 50s, this thing called Sputnik kind of changed the world. Um, and I'd argue, um, and, and there's probably a two or three part twos to this, um, if it wasn't for this stuff, we probably wouldn't be in this room. Um, it drove silicon development, it drove communications development, like you would not believe these, these programs. It was a real race. It sadly also tied to defense. So, um, you know, everyone's out campaigning for nuclear disarmament, which is a great thing, but a lot of that technology brought us to where we are today. Um, and, you know, fortunately, we've turned that into a, a somewhat of a good. Um, so three programs, Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo. Um, and, and a lot of people forget about Mercury and Gemini, especially Gemini. Not, not a lot of people think about that. But without Gemini, Apollo would never have got off the ground because they learned so many things. Um, things like uh, how to do rendezvous properly, uh, how to do um, or Earth orbit insertion. All of those things came out of the Gemini project. Um, and and what the one thing I take away from this um, is this program was about people. Um, it had probably one of the highest, at the, at the point in time, one of the highest um, diversity rates in any project in history, uh, with an unbelievable no number of women um, and ethnic minorities in it. Um, and also a huge number of young people. The, the average age um, for most people working on this project was a kind of early to mid-20s. Um, and, and occasionally in Houston, they have a problem. Um, the, the, the driver for spaceflight, the thing that they realized very early on was without, so, there were so many things to do that one or two pilots could never do it all. So it required some help i.e. mission control. And actually, when mission control was started, it was actually called Mercury Control, and the manned space flight network was actually called the Mercury Space Flight Network. So, so you know, when it started, they didn't really know how far this was going to go. Um, this is uh, a mock mission operation control room at, at Houston that you'll all seen probably in uh, the Apollo 13 um, movie. And, and there's a one box on here, the network box, which is the guy who ran, ran the network, basically. He was responsible for connectivity. Uh, and you'll see he's, he sits quite close, one to the guy from the DOD and two to the flight director who kind of ran the program, um, you know, throughout. And, and then you had uh, Tell Me, which is all about telemetry and control, which is all about kind of sending remote controls um, requirements to um, various different vehicles. Um, and, and this, you know, I was kind of, I kind of tripped up on this because I was looking at things of, um, I was looking at, you know, we had a, a great presentation from the barn guys. One of the things I've been, look, we've been looking at, at BT, and to put my hat on just for a minute, is how do we connect customers in difficult to connect places? And it's a massive focus for us. Um, and, and, you know, this is kind of what tripped me on to looking at some of these things. And, and one of the things that came across um, was actually Apollo was a CDN, um, ApolloNet. They had to deliver voice, so you know, conversation between uh, mission control astronauts, presidents, and other famous people, uh, telemetry, what's actually going on. Um, and it's sad to say that I think um, back in the 60s, they had better telemetry than we have on our networks today, and it's something I've, I've taken a lot of uh, insight from. And command, being able to send controls. And at the time, particularly in Apollo, um, one of the things that really um, moved the project forward and got money for it um, was video actually seeing what was happening. And if you reflect what was happening in, in the Soviet Union at the time, um, pretty much all the missions that were run out of the Soviet Union were done in secret. So, they, so the other big challenge, let me just probably put these in slightly, slightly wrong order. The other big challenge was weight. Um, 
launching something into space, your big big focus is weight, and you see that in, in, in launches even today. So the notion of, of having to do a multi-service network, voice, telemetry, command, and video, um, you really needed a way of doing that cheaply. So they looked at, actually, the same frequencies we pretty much use for Wi-Fi and UMTS today. Um, and, the, and, and in effect, multiplex that with, with um, subcarriers to carry all the different um, things that they needed to carry. The beauty of that was um, they could put one box in each unit, and it was kind of a similar box, save a lot of weight, save a lot of, of, of investment. And then with that, they could standardize some of the components around um, aerials, antennas, and, and the, the control devices. So all the, all the different, and, and remember, all, most of these systems inside um, the spacecraft and mission control were autonomous. They really didn't talk to each other. The, the thing that brought the systems together were the people back in mission control. Um, on this slide, you see where what kind of bands were used, and, and pretty much S-band, which is two to four gigahertz, um, is used, and today, even in the, the ISS, it's the same band that's used. Um, interestingly, I met um, uh, Gene Cernan recently, who was the, the last man on the moon. If you haven't seen his movie, go see it. It's phenomenal. It's just, just out in the UK now. Um, and, and one of the backup systems for communications was Morse code, believe it or not. And, and he, you know, I was asking, as part of this, I've been asking people, a lot of these guys, you know, what, what was the impact of communications? And, and you know, um, one of the feedbacks I got was if, for Apollo 13, if they'd lost comms, it would have been game over for the astronauts. They just wouldn't have come back. There's no, no question about that whatsoever. Um, so Morse code was the backup, and Gene Cernan made the comment that he spent more time learning Morse code than he did learning to fly um, the, 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 the whole space shuttle and, and the, sorry, the Apollo rocket, Saturn V, and, and the, the lunar lander to the point where it became a big issue for them. Um, and they actually started to look, if there'd been an Apollo 18 and 19, which sadly there wasn't, they actually had started to look for another way of doing backup comms because it was the overhead of doing it was just too difficult. Um, the, and then the other thing that, that this telemetry was used for, um, when, when um, the Apollo missions landed on the moon, they had um, what they call all set, which was a bunch of scientific programs. There was a, a, a kind of a laser thing that would actually measure how far uh, the moon was, and actually that was still running until very recently. Um, there's a bunch of other seismic experiments um, that were there that were left there and ran for some years after. Um, and, and one of the big challenges they had, and, and, and it kind of feels crazy thinking about it now, was actually explaining to people the concept, a concept that today we would take for granted. So a guy on the moon really in comms to his buddy or off the, off the, the uh, limb back to, the, back to Earth. People couldn't visualize that because it really hadn't been done before. You know, today we take mobile phone and texting and Facebook kind of for granted, but in order to get the systems that they needed to be built, they often came up with kind of drawings like this to say, well, this is how we think this would work. Um, and, and then here's a, a kind of example of, of some of the, the comms that were built. So you have the high gain antennas um, in the corner, they're from the command module that would fold out um, as the command module um, disembarked from the third stage of the Saturn. Um, and, and that was a that was a, 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 a directional. It was actually automatically controlled to always get the best position. Now, obviously, um, you need something back on Earth um, to control that. And this is the NASCOM network, as they called it, for Apollo 5. Apollo 5 was an unmanned mission, and it was probably the first proper test of the whole Saturn V stack. For those that don't know, the Saturn V rockets are 363 meter. Um, kind of device, the most powerful vehicle ever built, still to this day, although NASA are going to launch something in 2019 that, that might be a bit more uh, spectacular. Um, it really came down, and, and, it, and it kind of adjusted as they learned things. I mean, every mission was about learning something. So Apollo 8, 9, 10 was about learning how the systems work, how to do docking, making sure everything worked in preparation for Apollo 11. And then, uh, and then what does the network actually look like? Well, if you think about, there's two challenges. There's your kind of launch to orbit challenge, and then use your, there's your kind of um, lunar orbit, lunar insertion to the moon, and then round the moon, which, which was never solved. Whenever they're on the other side of the moon, there was no comms. And then on the way back, and then the landing. And this was kind of designed, so actually the space part from orbit to the moon was actually relatively simple. You could do that with three big dishes. But all the other pieces of, of launch and landing, and if you think about it, those are probably the, 
the most precarious parts where you've got pretty significant um, thrust and a very set of complex um, calculations on what's the weather like, you know, all the guidance was all computerized, it was all automatic, um, pretty much until stage three went. Um, so so you, you had to have, you know, from Florida where they launched, there was a whole set of series of ships to hand communications over. The crazy thing about this is a high-speed line that they talked about um, was two kilobits a second. Um, and, and, you know, when, and, it, and it makes sense because when you reflect on the, the computer that was in um, both the, the LEM and the, the, the uh, command module, it had 73K of memory, um, which is just incredible. I mean, we could run about 4,000 Apollo missions just on you know, the phones that we've got in our pockets. Um, but again, that, that was bleeding edge, and, and the guys at MIT um, who did a lot of that, that software design and computer design really pushed the boundaries to get there and really gave America um, a real advantage in silicon and, and semiconducting, um, you know, capabilities. Um, Three places that really stood out, um, Goldston, Canberra um, were two of the big kind of dish sites. And um, any Australians in the audience today? No. Hooray. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, because um, uh, um, normally they kind of ra rabbit on about how great this was for them. But I mean, I, seriously, there's a film called The Dish. I don't know if anyone's seen it. It's a bit of a comedy, but actually based on a true story. If you haven't seen it, I recommend it. And it, and it kind of shows you the challenges. And, and, and in this world, you know, if you go back to this map, um, they had a whole load of kind of diplomatic envoys at various parts of the world kind of take it, you know, when there was a big important part of the mission, the, the envoys would go out and, and kind of take people to dinner so that they couldn't interfere with what was going on with the mission at that time. There's a huge kind of plan around it. It's not well publicized, um, but it's something that happened. And, and I, I met one of the mission controllers, um, Gene Krantz, a few weeks ago, and I, was, I asked him about communications, and he said his big challenge was keeping all the stations going, particularly there's some, some places in Africa they were having to use where the kind of regime changed every week, um, and they were having to kind of continually fun funnel money to keep them happy. Um, the other big place was Spain, um, and this is what, what the, the site just outside Madrid looked like in 1969. Um, this was, was partly funded by NASA, and, and actually I'm going to go out there later on this year because it's now a huge complex of these uh, wide band dishes. Um, and, and as a major, you know, those three, th those three stations have become the main deep space network uh, for communications. Um, at the time, there was about NASA and, and the various um, Air Force agencies and military agencies had kind of several hundred different networks. Over time, they've come together. Um, and actually, today, you can actually look at what these networks are doing. And, and this is one thing I love about NASA. They wrote down everything that they did. I mean, everything. You can, if you go into the NASA um, Museum in Washington, it's it's huge. You can find out just about anything that, that you that you want to want to see. This is a live website. You can actually go to it. You can click on the different dishes and find out what what, what craft it's it's tracking. And then uh, and then this is a new this is kind of a newer station that, that um, has been re built uh, recently in Guam, particularly for really deep missions to kind of beyond you know the edge of our solar system, Saturn, Saturn and beyond uh, to Juno on Jupiter. And then finally, um, the, the, the thing that I really um, take away with this is, um, and it's something I suggest to my team is we've kind of got a bit lazy. Um, you know, we get all this, we just talked about one gig and we kind of need probably a few hundred meg. It's how do we make better use of the facilities that we've got? Um, and, and that's really um, all I wanted to cover. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Bear in mind, I'm not an expert in this. No questions. Oh, here we go. Actually, Martin was at one of the Apollo launches, and he was resurrected afterwards. I'll ignore that. <laughs> um, yeah, Martin Levy, Cloud Flare, but it's got nothing to do with that. Um, I'm going to not do the token Australian response to you, actually. Okay. But, but if, if I don't know if anybody else has been uh, out there. Um, anybody else actually visited parks? No. Okay, so there's this movie called The Dish that you mentioned. Yeah. If you go to Sydney, Australia, drive six hours east, yeah. 
which is a tiny percentage of Australia. Um, west. Yeah, west. Yeah, that way, west. Um, well, you know, it's the, the other hemisphere, doesn't it, Swap? No. Um, anyway, go visit the dish. Um, it, 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 it's, it, it's this frigging enormous uh, radio telescope uh, dish that was used um, uh, for, for Apollo and other, other missions. Still but in use. Still in use it today. Is still, sorry, it's still ISS. in use today. Yeah. Um, it, it, it is geeky as heck, and I don't know if this is the right audience to convince people to do geeky things, but um, go do I've been out there three times, um, and, and it's just totally fun. But the second part, of the, if you go out there, stay overnight or even stay for a long, spend some time at night, and just, if you've got time lapse on, which everybody has on a phone these days, just time lapse this dish w w working at night. It, it, is, it is something amazing. And go yeah. watch the movie to see why it's important. But there is, in fact, an exhibit there, that's what I was going to say, about the Apollo 11 and about the, yeah. what, what they were involved in. And um, it was so close to not getting that video. Uh, it was quite, I mean, the oh, movie yeah. covers it, but some of the equipment's there. And the last part, which is really cool for me, they still have a working PDP-1145 that does all the positioning for the dish because, well, it works. And, and, and it just works, and that's it. And there's a bunch of Visual 100 terminals all burnt in that still are there. Um, it, it's worth trying to get a tour, but that, that, took, yeah. that took quite a few emails on my part when I did it. Yeah, I, th I think there's, the, I mean, the one, there's a couple of follow-ups I'd love to do on this. Is one is the computing power that was used then. Um, and, and actually, I'm, I'm very, very privileged. I'm going to visit in um, Kennedy. They've still got one of the computer centers that they literally just turned the lights off. I'm, I'm going to see it in about a month's time. Um, and, and, it, and literally, they just turned it off because they didn't have the money to decommission it. So they just shut it down. Um, and I think there's a, there's a huge story on that. And, and, then, and then how that evolved into SAGE, which is a missile defense network that the, that the US built which is ultimately, it was all built by IBM predominantly, it's ultimately the founding parts of what we now recognize as, as the internet. And, and I'll, I'll, I'm hoping to, uh, if the program committee can be bribed, um, I might bring you that, some of that story. One more question, I think. Oh, sorry, Mike, I didn't um, see you. Yeah, I think, I think yeah, the, sh the whole sort of ship in a bottle of that shut down computer center sounds absolutely fascinating. Um, the other thing is actually, if you're local to here, you, you'll know anyway. Um, there is a radio telescope not very far from here. It's sort of over there, the other side of the airport, which is Jodrell Bank, and that is, again, another functioning radio telescope. Um, it's huge. It's brill. And the visitor, visitor centre is quite fun, and, and they do TV from there as well. So when they do uh, stargazing with um, Dara O'Brien and, and, and Brian Cox talking about millions and billions of stars, um, I mean, I think, uh, that's, that's where that comes from. And I, that's I only should, just out yeah. there. So if you've got time while you're up here and you're not local to Manchester, go over tomorrow. It might be it's worth the trip. That's a good point. I went, so BT, I don't know if you know, we've got BT archives in Holborn. So I went there to have a look to see if there was anything that we'd been involved in um, from this program. And, and we were involved in a couple of, it was then the GPO or whatever it was called. We were involved in a couple of the, the, the landline things, but nothing as exciting as, as this dish. One more question, and I think we have to wrap it up. Otherwise, I'll get carried off the stage. <laughs> so, thank you. A very brief remark on... on uh, another very cool bit of space technology that actually uh, inspired the NS dist and you can see it it's at the, in the NSA museum uh, next to the NSA um, in Maryland National Cryptologic Museum and there they had the problem that if you want to communicate with a satellite you want to be the only one that is communicating with that satellite yeah uh, NASA has to be really they, they actually will comment about everything in spaceflight they're very open the moment you ask well what is the crypto with the Hubble Space Telescope they escort you out of the room yeah um, there is a device uh, that's in the uh, National Cryptologic Museum, and that's the crypto box that was a sort of serial proxy that is used to communicate with satellites. So it sits there, it's a little black box, the NSA delivered it, would not tell anyone how it worked, and they would deliver two of them, one of them was downstream, one of them was in the space segment. And whenever a satellite would fail, everyone would blame that box. Because it was a secret box, no one would tell you how it worked. So they said, yeah, we are sure that the satellite is fine. The reason we <laughs> cannot talk to it is that NSA damn box. NSA box. And then the NSA did something clever. And that's actually inspired DNS DIST. They made that machine earn its weight, quite literally. So what they did, they said, okay, it's doing all this secret crypto stuff that we're not going to talk about. But next time you blame uh, us for the satellite being down, sadly, our little box provides its own telemetry. 
So the box could provide statistics on how well your link was doing and how many crypto failures there were and also crucially the temperature the temperature of your satellite and that allowed them to say um, sorry uh, our box is up we can talk to it but I can report that your satellite is at zero Kelvin which probably means that you messed it up yeah I mean I, and, and just one one point to that I was going to put this graph up but they actually I mean they did a lot of modeling as to how the radio frequency would work and, and again this is all on the internet the great thing is it's all available on the internet and they got the, the thing that amazes me um, and it's something I'm going to go and try and find out more about because I think it applies in our industry is they modeled the waveform of how the S band would would actually work for various parts of the the mission and they got it absolutely spot on for all of it. Um, all the issues they had weren't to do with actually the technology, they were to do with the operations and the, and, the, and the deployment of it rather than what they'd selected. And I think there's a lot for us to learn uh, from that. If I think about traffic modeling, uh, pop deployment, stuff like that, if we could model that much better, we'd get better more use out of our, our money. And with that, thank you very much.